from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. Hello. I was, I was wondering, is she going to do the hell? she going to do the hell? Well, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we do not have a guest this week. Well, we don't always need a guest, but yeah. We don't we, always need a we've guest. We've had guests. We've had some guests, and we're trying to line up more guests. Yeah. So just a, a reminder, if you, especially if you are a millennial or can play one on radio, and <laughs> and you would like We'd to- We'd like actual millennials. We'd like actual millennials. Um, right. Especially if you would like to talk about- our issue for the the year, which is millennial economics. So how this uh, economic system is affecting you, how you're navigating, how you're getting by or not getting by, and, um, you know, strategies and tactics, you know, yeah. and um, help uh, helping us to understand the challenges this uh, generation faces. Yeah. So we don't have a walk to report. Sadly, no. We did get out yesterday, though, for, yeah, a whole, we did. for a whole family trip. Which feels like a miracle, to be honest. <laughs> it was fairly miraculous. We were all dressed. We were all dressed. Everyone we were even on. We were in, even uh, pretty well dressed up. Yeah. So we went to a wedding. It was beautiful and lovely. It was a beautiful, lovely wedding. It was uh, a wedding of a family friend, and uh, his family is of the Baha'i faith. Yes. Which I've never seen a Baha'i wedding before. Oh yeah, and I they're, I know very really little okay. about that group. Yeah, mm-hmm. but um, they did some stuff where they had uh, like a drum circle, drum circle, live music. Yeah, um, lots of prayer. You know? Yeah. So um, our kids also, you know, they basically allowed anyone to like grab a drum and join in. Oh, and they went to town. And so, <laughs> at, went, at one point, all four little boy hobbits yeah, were just going. We're on the drum. So Joshua would like show up and just sit in and start banging on the congas. <laughs> it was great. Actually. And you know, he doesn't really know how to play, but it didn't really matter, didn't really and matter, no. everyone seemed to be perfectly they were down for it down with it and yeah. content with him sitting in and and jamming with them mm-hmm. and so he got a, a lot of like positive feedback they're like you know following along with him no one is yeah. like what's this child doing here mm-hmm. you know? well and there was also this sort of like um several times they just started break dancing like children we're break dancing on the dance floor. <laughs> I mean, you know, half a dozen just spinning around. Yeah, running. Just, our our kids would go out and dance. It didn't turn into a big dancing wedding. The no. the DJ wasn't really getting the crowd moving. You well, know. there was there was no DJ. Well, it it was a guy who was playing music, but it, oh, well, there was a guy playing. I thought there was just like uh, some recorded music. Like, remember you made a tape for our wedding? Yes, I thought that's what it was. But well, there was a guy who was sitting at a laptop for most of the. Wedding over at that table, like picking tracks and playing them. Oh, was it? Are you? Because I thought that guy was uh, live streaming it to Facebook or some such social oh, media. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, because there was this time when they had a camera up and they were talking yeah. to people on social media who okay, couldn't make so, it. Okay, so maybe he wasn't actually like there to be a DJ. DJ, right? But there was a soundtrack. There was like a playlist. It yeah. just it wasn't uh, music that was really picked out and organized to get people moving and dancing. No. I think they picked out their first dance. Yeah, so it was and that may have been it. Like you say, it said kind of low key with the music as well. Yeah, but uh, in in the best way. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. So a very welcoming environment, um, mm-hmm. a nice place, child um, friendly. Child friendly. That was really important to us, honestly. Yeah. I hope I don't know anybody that would invite me to their wedding and say, like, don't bring your kids. Don't bring your kids or else you have to be absolutely silent. You know, yeah, I, I, I don't think I know anybody that would do that, but yeah, maybe it's I just do. it's just not going to work out. Yeah. I, I, I just won't come. I was okay. briefly concerned because it's rained an enormous amount in southeast Michigan over the last yeah. couple of days. And so while they were serving drinks uh, after the ceremony... Um, quite a bit of water started bubbling up from the drain behind the bar, and also from yeah. the drain in the restroom, in the like the men's room. Yeah, and I didn't. It kept like it was flooding the carpet really quickly. Yeah, 
And I was like, oh, this could, could be, be bad. bad. <laughs> Interesting and not in a good way. Like suddenly we're going to, one half of the building is going to be full of, you know, two feet of water, right? Yeah. But it, it's it's slowed down. It slowed down. They they got right on top of it. And there was a second sort of bathroom. Mopping so. it up. There was yeah. another bathroom in a different building, but it was pretty strange. Yeah. Yeah. So. But it was, it was really a good wedding. It was, it good was a everyone. good wedding. It was good to see yeah. everyone. So I thought today, since we're not well prepared, we would basically do uh, some catching up on yeah. books and videos, so that's reading and watching. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. Just for the record, I, I think we need to just admit, accept, and embrace that we're never well prepared. <laughs> I mean, that, just, you know. I, I feel bad because, you know, within living memory, that is just months ago, Yeah, we've done shows where... <clears throat> where we really did have notes, you know. Notes and lots of prep, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I've, for a couple of them, I wrote an essay. I wrote yeah, essays. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. But, so, we're hoping to do more... To get back into that space. To yeah. get back into that, at least to some extent. And also, uh, I think our guests are going to be here to help us um, get some topics going, even when we haven't had a lot of R&D time. Right. But um, and also, I think uh, guests help it help us to make more space for R and D. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, reading, watching, reading, and watching. So these are kind of not in order, but please um, join in and because yep. you watched most of these things. I, I was think. here for it. Yeah. So one of them that we haven't talked about yet is an episode, uh, a couple episodes of Star Trek: The Next Generation, one <laughs> called "The First Duty." Which one was that? Was that the one with um, uh, Wesley? Yes. Yes, okay. So a lot of these shows I never actually watched in the day, back in the day. Oh, yeah. I was in college when Star Trek The Next Generation started. I believe it was actually my freshman year it started mm -hmm. up. And I know people were in the basement lounge of my dorm every week watching these right. shows. I really didn't find myself with that much time, that much time. <laughs> to do this well, and with that crowd or inclination or with that crowd. Right. I did see some of them, but um, rapidly started missing them. Mm -hmm. And so there are, you know, and I've seen some in reruns over the years, but, right. or on VHS tapes, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, there are many uh, episodes I think of the next generation that I have never seen. Yeah. yeah. So we I, have a set. I didn't watch it. You didn't watch it. But like you did watch you did watch Voyager. I watched Voyager from day one. It was like really into it. Yeah, I've I've missed at least half of Voyager. Yeah, and at least half of Deep Space Nine. Actually, yeah. I watched all of these. Yeah, pretty much all of Deep Space Nine. Yeah, I, like I had, I still had TV then. Yeah. Okay. But this one, um, still a user, <laughs> still a TV user. In this episode, Crusher is a cadet in Starfleet. Starfleet, yep. Starfleet and he's, he's away at Starfleet Academy. Um, uh, his squad of trainee pilots is involved in a fatal accident. Right. In which another student is it's killed. killed. Uh, this is really, I thought, one of the better Next Generation episodes. It was very good. Um, you and I were kind of debating what we thought of Will Wheaton's acting in it. Yeah. I've never been a fan of Phil Wheaton. Yeah. So, uh, and I wasn't like more impressed with him in this than I have been in the past. No. I was actually really impressed with um, who plays the Picard. What's his name? Patrick Stewart. Stewart. Patrick Stewart. I was yeah. more impressed with Patrick Stewart. Patrick Stewart does a great job in this. Um, I thought so. The, the one thing I, I will say in favor of Will Wheaton's acting in this one is mm -hmm. that he's really underplaying everything. Mm -hmm. He doesn't show very much emotion, and I th I think that that's works with a character who uh, who's trying to damp down his conflicting loyalties, like who's got a big personal conflict. Oh right, that you and, end up not saying much of anything, and right. and, and as a, he's kind of an introverted character to begin with, mm -hmm. and I think really he he does in fact wind up not saying much of anything, and he shows some distress and anguish like in his eyes and whatnot but, but he's not really it. wearing his heart on his sleeve mm -hmm. he's trying hard to be grown up 
To be a grown up. He's right. still basically a kid. Yeah. But he's gotten himself into a mess here that's clearly way above his experience. Right. Emotionally. You emotionally. Know? And just generally. Yeah. I mean, it would be challenging for an adult right. to be involved in a fatal accident. Right. And um, are we spo- are you in spoilers? Yeah, we can do spoilers. Um, I never know if people care. Well, it's, you know, uh, you know okay. It's warning, 30 years old. Warning spoilers for a 30-year-old 30 30 TV show. <laughs> uh, but yes, it's, um, so they have this, it's not entirely an accident, right? Yes. They were they were very reckless and trying to do this band maneuver. Yes, they it, the their, uh, the leader was, uh, uh, a very much a, a showboater big showboater and he wanted to uh break an all like an all-time record he wanted to apparently the last time a group of cadets tried to do this, this maneuver, maneuver someone, someone was died. killed right and that's why it's been banned right it's because cadets died doing this and he wanted to do, like go literally end his he was getting ready to graduate he wanted to end his career, uh, career at starfleet not end it, but like wind up his wind up his time in the academy in a, in a big way, yeah, in with a, a big bang. flashy way, right? And you got the rest of the squad to agree to it. And yeah, they tried it, and a cadet died. One of the cadets was not, and people were warning him. They were giving him some pushback and saying, "We don't know that we're ready for this. This is a very this. challenging maneuver." I'm not sure it's safe. I'm one of the one of the cadets panicked, and you know. Band, blew up. It blew up. Right. Anyway, um, so his that character's name is is uh, Locano. Yeah. Right, and it's played by. Let's see. What's that guy? Wait, he, is that the character or the actor? I think the character's name is Locano, and he played. He oh. also played Parrish in. Yeah, um, C- Cadet Nicholas Locano. Right. The actor is Robert Duncan McNeil. Yes, and he played. Parish in uh, Voyager. Tom Paris. Right, Tom Paris. I'm, uh, yeah. Not with an H, but with an I. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I was a little startled because I thought he was the same guy. Yeah, like <laughs> I, I was a little, like I said, I don't think right. I've ever seen this episode. And I certainly haven't seen it since watching Voyager. Mm-hmm. So it was a little startling to see him there. Like Tom but Paris? But he was good in this episode. He was. I mean, was. better than Crusher or <laughs> Wesley, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, the only thing that I really, I kind of don't like about this episode um, is that there were lots of scenes that, uh, for reasons of time or whatever, right. they just sort of had to describe, right? That oh. didn't happen on camera. Well, I was very frustrated by, like, so Picard kept visiting this gardener guy on campus right? oh yeah who apparently how old is this guy how old could he possibly be right if he was an old guy when picard was a cadet <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah. so what yeah. is this like this 90 year old gardener yeah, right? yeah. well pe- the I, people i don't know they don't give his exact age but people in this future routinely live longer you oh know. okay okay not and have productive lo- longer yeah, productive they're lives. not 200 Right, but they could be a hundred. But they live to be well over a hundred and have greater health for the majority of their lives. I think that's implied in a lot of the shows. Okay, that the people who die of old age are are very old by our standards. Right, you know, so like they're like a hundred and twenty dying of old age. Yeah, or or thereabouts. Yeah. So this guy, I I found it kind of annoying. They kept alluding to things in the past. Yes, and never really fleshing them out or connecting them. Yeah. So it was interesting and, and intriguing at first. Yeah. Where they're like, "Oh yes, I recall when you were a young cadet." Right. And right. Right. I'm kind of waiting for like. Yeah. Well, the we penny, s- this gets know? set up. There's an episode where Picard, is, uh, his artificial heart goes bad or something, and right. he's in surgery, dying, and we flash back to his impetuous young cadet days, and we oh. do get a story about what he was like. And how he got the artificial heart. Right. Yeah. And Q shows up, you know, it's kind of like an alternative timeline thing. You mm-hmm. get to see what if you had, what if you had been different? What if things had been, been different, different for you? But turn this another spoiler. It turns out Picard got in a bar fight. Right. But with his bravado and, you know, and right. winds up pissing off some giant alien. Right. And mm-hmm. gets stabbed through the heart. Right. right, and that's why he's got an artificial, artificial heart. heart. And so they said, "Well, what happened if you 
back down from that fight. And it turns out he would have had a very different life Mm -hmm. because his like youthful impetuousness and also this big dose of humility that comes from nearly dying, right? Right. Was essential to his character's development, to to building a leader. Right. Right. So it was quite interesting episode. Which is what I'm always talking about with yeah. both Josh and Mary. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, you know, if he can if make it. If they survive their childhoods <laughs> and their be, adolescence. Right. They'll yeah, really be gifted adults. Their, like, strength of will, you is know. Breathtaking. Is quite astounding. Their tenacity and all that. Absolutely. But it could also go wrong for them. It can go wrong. It can go really wrong. <laughs> yeah. Like, some of the danger that I see themselves, see them, like, flirt with. Yeah. I'm always like... Oh my God! Well, they're gonna tr- an, they're gonna attempt a, a, a band maneuver in their spaceships, <laughs> most likely. Yes. <laughs> I just thought I'd try like the Eagles yeah. loop. Was that wrong? Yeah. Well, so Locano is is not portrayed very sympathetically, and no. we don't get to see much of an arc for his character, no. and that's kind of annoying. So we hear about at the end, we hear that he was. Um, expelled. We hear also that he basically took the fall for the he team. He took the fall for the team, and he was very clear in saying, "I bullied them into this. It was my fault, my Part responsibility." Which was true. There was no suggestion that it wasn't true. Right. But um, this would have been great a great scene. To Instead, see. we we have a lot of scenes that were in there that didn't contribute to much of a character arc. Right. right? So and then we missed that. Yeah, right. we missed that. So. We we could have seen on in the show this moment where Lacano like actually grows up, you grows know, up, man's up, takes responsibility takes for what he did. Responsibility, and in his case, the the consequences are are relatively severe. He's he's he not going to he's losing his career. He's not going to be in Starfleet ever. It's not going to happen. No. Yeah. Well, and that's yeah. it. Seems fitting. It is fitting. But yeah, it's a it's a severe consequence. Right. And it would have been. It would have been valuable as a viewer to see him grow up and accept that. Yeah. Except, I think, as far as the show's concerned, yeah. the show's not actually concerned with that. No, it's not. The show's but concerned with Wesley's development. It's not about him. Right, it's about Wesley's character development. Yeah, but it seems like they could have kind of trimmed a few scenes to make room for, like... A, a good scene with A good scene actor? with yeah. Lacano. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so there was another one that we watched. What was that um, one? We're, I, I should point out that we're working our way through um, an article published on the Tor.com website that's like mm-hmm. um, a viewer's guide to the best of Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh, yeah, yeah. So how to get through the whole series in, For I think, 40 hours. Less uh, sci-fi inclined listeners. Yeah. What's the Tor.com website? Oh, Tor is a publisher. It's a science mm-hmm. fiction book publisher. Right, okay. And they have bloggers that write about science fiction and right. fantasy and whatnot. So this article is how to get through uh, Next Generation in 40 Hours. Yeah. And, should, see, and see the good shows, because there's a lot of bad ones. It. Yeah, it picks out like, here's 40 hours of the absolute best. But most that, watchable, most enjoyable. Next Generation ran for like, I think nine seasons or something. It, w- it ran a while. Yeah. I remember seeing it in the 90s. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of show, there's a lot that isn't really the best. Right. And it took it a, it took the series a while to really get good. Mm-hmm. And so we're actually coming up on some of the episodes that are considered the absolute best of mm-hmm. the series. This one was pretty good. Cause and Effect. This is the one that involves the time loop. Um, oh, yeah. Where they're like, they keep starting again and they keep having this deja yeah, vu. And they're like, yeah. So, so it, it's really got a great cold open in yes, that even yes. before the opening credits roll, the Enterprise blows up. Bing. Bing. It's like destroyed. Okay. And then you're like, huh. And then the opening credits roll, and you're like, well, what, what happens next? <laughs> what now, America? <laughs> um, and we started at the beginning again. Yeah. So it's a time loop story. Mm-hmm. Um, you were convinced that the Doctor Who episode called Heaven Sent must have been at least somewhat inspired by this oh, story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That, that one where they, uh, which, the one with the angels. 
No, the the one where Capaldi is trapped in oh, the, yes, in yes, the it's, confession it's, dial. Confession dial. No, that was. Yeah, I, I'm convinced. Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know for sure, but there are some famous time loop stories. There are some right. famous time loop and they short may stories. They may both be, be coming from the sure, same source. They may have a because it's just too many touch. Yeah, similar touch points. But what's it, what's interesting is watching like the um, watching these scenes play out repeatedly. Mm-hmm. Basically, they they gradually come to realize that something's wrong, and they come to realize that it's happened before. Right. And they are stuck in a loop, and then they're trying to figure out, okay, what decisions do we, do we need make, to make, make differently? But they don't really have any information getting into the time loop to inform their decision making. Right. Right. So the whole thing, you also, as you watch it, you realize that they're not just replaying the scenes. Right. You're not just watching the same scene play over over and over. They shot every scene over and over. Yes. Right. The dialogue is very slightly different. The camera moves and the camera angles are slightly different. different. Even the explosion effects that they use as the Enterprise blows up, they're different different explosions. Right. Because Because it's a different experience. It's a different iteration of the timeline. Right. And that's really... Fun, but it, well, and also just had a lot of texture, and it keeps it from becoming actually boring. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. So, it, but not uh, believability, but it allows you to su- continue to suspend your disbelief. Yeah, right. And there, there are a number of little gags, like Wes or uh, not Wesley Crusher, um, uh, Doctor Crusher, Beverly Crusher keeps knocking over her wine glass, and it breaks. And in every scene, she's like, "The wine glass breaks." breaks. And as this goes on. She has this increasing sense of deja vu, like, this has happened before. before. And she, like, is, oh, I yeah. don't want to put it there. I don't want it to break. It right. it somewhere else. And, and then it breaks. It breaks again. Right. right. Uh, so it seems inevitable. And then, and then uh, in, like, the last iteration, she's, you don't see her. She's on the comm link to uh, sick bay. Right. And she's talking to them, and she's like, this is blah, blah, Because she's, like, she's understanding more of what's happening. Right. And gaining, like, starting to have more memories of it happening before. Mm-hmm. And she's talking to them, and then she's, like, about to sign off. And you're like, oh, interesting. The wine glass didn't, didn't break. break. And then you hear this over the little intercom oh, smash. Smash. And then it's like, are you all right? What? She's like, oh, yes, That's fine. fine. <laughs> It's it was rich with detail. The whole episode really was rich with detail. I want to I want to recommend um, an unusual novel mm. um, by James Tiptree Jr. Oh, she's always good. Um, she didn't write very many novels. She's mostly known for her short stories, stories. Mm-hmm. but she did write an amazing novel called Brightness Falls from the Air, and. Mm-hmm. In that novel, there is a time loop scenario like this. There is um, a, um, basically, there's something that happened uh, or that people expected to happen, and they changed everything they could to try and keep it from happening. Mm-hmm. But um, it seems to be uh, asserting itself as this is just how reality has to play out. This is just it. This has uh, to happen. Yeah, and it happens over and over again that like ke- things keep sort of pushing the characters back towards this outcome, right? And they're running away from it as fast as they can. Mm-hmm. And it's a little like we're talking about Doctor Who, the way that Clara flees her death, right? right. Um, it's inevitable. Her her death is inevitable, but we know that she's she's fleeing it in a TARDIS with um, me, right? Right. The the uh, the girl from Game, Game of, of Thrones, Thrones. Right. right? With her character, with Lady Me. Yeah, and they're off going to have as many adventures as they can right. together before, like the timeline eventually collapses on collapses the on Clara, and she is dead as she died in the in the first right. in the show, right? right. So. A Shielda, yeah. A Mie's, Shielda. Me's first name was a Shielda. Right. And she like was a Shielda so long she forgot who she was. She started calling herself me because she's she unique. She could remember that. Right. Yeah, well, beca- uh, because she's unique. Because she's unique. there's no one like her, you right. know, who's lived as long. Mm-hmm. But okay, James Tiptree Jr., Brightness Falls from the Air. And I think that book may also have inspired some Doctor Who writers, maybe some Star Trek writers. When, Likely so. It's, Likely a, so. it's a fascinating short novel it's really an oddball Mm -hmm. work but very beautiful Mm -hmm. um so anyway now one of the things i liked in this episode um so the spoiler is they have 
they've got to give themselves some kind of a clue. Yes, yeah. They have to get information to, to, to their the, next loop. To the next iteration. Otherwise, it's just going to play out exactly the right. same. And so um, they eventually decide to send some minute piece of data forward. Yes. And D- Data sends himself the number three. Yes. And it keeps showing up and showing up. And they're like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's all over the place for no reason. Yes. And yeah. then finally, at the last moment... There's this thing where uh, Commander Riker recommends a course of action. Yes. And Data recommends a course of action. Right. And the captain says, do what Data says. Yes. And at the last moment, Data realizes, oh, that's the thing that didn't work. Uh huh. We need to do what Riker says. And yeah. then it works. But wh- wh- why was it three? Why did three? Riker has three bars in his collar. Oh, right, right, right. So, as he, right, so at the last right. moment, he glances at Riker. And yes. sees his three bars. So the data he and sends realizes, is realizes, oh, we better do what, what, what his yes. plan because his yeah, and they did. They, they succeed. They succeed. But I was like, you know, this, it also could mean, you know, we need a third way, a third right? way, third way politics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's that deep. We're but elect I did a third party. This I did time. appreciate the. Um, Maybe we can get out coda. of this bad timeline. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're stuck in the bad timeline. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure there's jumping this timeline. Reality is coming up. Catching up with hard. this. But um, the Dakota. little Coda was this other ship. that, Like the, the thing that they blow up because they oh, run right, into another right. ship. They, they hit another ship that comes out of this spatial anomaly. This, right. What, this comes out of this anomaly. waving thing. And then it hits them and they both blow up, right? Yeah, yeah. So they finally pass each other just narrowly. Yes. They both survive. Yes. And apparently it's... Uh, Kelsey Grammer. <laughs> yes, it's Kelsey Grammer. I'm like, Kelsey Grammer? Seriously? It's Fraser. Fraser, where have you been? No, right. it's it's Kelsey Grammer as the captain of this yeah. other ship yeah. that's been stuck in this time loop for 80 years. Well, yeah, yeah. And they're like, who are you guys? You look like Starfleet, but, but all your insignia is wrong. Wrong and different and like your ship looks so... so looks like a counterfeit or something. Primitive or something. <laughs> yeah, it's you know? bizarre. It's, it's weird. And yeah. so they've been stuck in this time loop for 80 yeah. years. And Picard's like... I think you should come over. You better come over. We got some explaining to do. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, this so it was is going to, we're going to need a drink. Right. So it was a great close. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's a, a great episode. It's, mm-hmm. they're getting up onto shows that are like unambiguously good. You yeah. know, like you say, is it Jim Jarmusch, like three good scenes and no bad scenes. Mm-hmm. Right. And we're, we're there we'll with there. this one. Yeah. yeah. Three good scenes, no bad ones. A few I think at least one great one. The one where she breaks the glass on the comm was a great yes. scene. Yes, yeah, at least yeah. Uh, uh, even some great scenes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now to a book. Yeah. Um, I finished a book that I've been picking at, like read a little like bit a at a time, <laughs> for a long time, called The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. Like a scam. Yeah. God. yeah. This was a, a book that a friend at work loaned me. Mm-hmm. And um, I kept reading these essays, and I'm like, yeah, okay, so there's like nothing here I really disagree with, but it's just not that interesting or insightful. Kind of a so. And I was, I've been sort of cataloging where there are interesting ideas, mm-hmm. you know, and like, okay, so here was an interesting idea in this essay, but it in no way justified a whole essay. A whole essay. Right. Let alone a whole book. Let alone a whole book. And then I finally got to. I guess what the the essays that were towards the back and they were like the anchor essays of the mm-hmm. book. Mm-hmm. And, and I, there's they're yeah. much better than the other essays. So there are mm-hmm. two that I think are are quite uh, that are worth reading. Mm-hmm. Now I'm not going to say I say they were worth reading, but I'm not going to say they actually have interesting solutions to prescribe. Yeah. Or suggest a useful strategy for resistance or or whatnot but i'll i'll talk about them a little bit anyway um the first one is called trump and the american collective psyche Mm -hmm. by thomas singer and Mm -hmm. uh, this looks at trump trump and trumpism from a jungian perspective Mm-hmm. And I have to say that I always like Jung, and I used to read Jung, mm-hmm. even though it wasn't classwork. Mm. This is some a problem I always had in college: is I'd have oh. classwork assigned, and I'd get distracted, and I'd go like instead of reading my textbook, I'd go read like 
all of Jung's collected dream yeah. analysis writing, yeah, you know, because yeah. right? I did, found it so much more interesting. <laughs> and then you couldn't turn that in. You know? Right, right. So this, yeah. I did this kind of thing all the time. So, um, so uh, I, I find it more interesting than Freud generally because yeah. I feel like his ideas are more universal than Freud's. Freud seems largely to be about Victorian, a Victorian man's sort of sexual obsessions. Whether yeah. uh, well, whereas I think um, Jung's ideas about the anima and the animus and and mm -hmm. the collective unconscious and the archetypes really mm -hmm. are more universal in human experience. They they're more yeah. cross cultural, right? Mm -hmm. They may not be perfect, but I feel like they're more useful. He, more useful, like yeah. he's onto something useful. Yeah, right. Yeah. So th that was good, uh, an interesting essay. The second one is called Who Goes Trump? Tyranny as a Triumph of Narcissism by Elizabeth Mika. Mm -hmm. Hang on, I have to make a, a note here. Note. note to self. Yeah, because I'm constantly editing books. my old blog posts. Oh, coworkers. <laughs> Don't borrow <laughs> books from coworkers. <laughs> Uh, tyranny is a triumph of narcissism. So this article talks about the role of narcissism uh, in Trumpism as a whole, in that uh, she talks about this, quote, toxic triangle, unquote, mm -hmm. formed by a tyrant, the tyrant's supporters, overt yep. supporters, and society at large. So okay. uh, Mika writes, through the process of identification, the tyrant's followers absorb his omnipotence and glory and imagine themselves as powerful as he is, the winners in the game of life. Mm -hmm. This identification heals the followers' narcissistic wounds. Mm -hmm. So to understand that, you've got to know a little bit about narcissism and mm -hmm. what, it, what it means. also tends to shut down their reason and conscience, allowing them to engage in immoral and criminal behaviors with a sense of impunity engendered by this identification. Yeah. And um, this fits in with some of the things we've been talking about. Uh, I keep feeling like the Trump administration kind of enables people in the sense of like being an enabler of someone who's ill, right? Yeah. Um, to yeah. F feel their aggrieved entitlement and act on it. Yeah. In violation of, of norms. Norms so, and law. Yeah. So it isn't that this kind of aggrieved entitlement is new. It's that no. uh, in the past, it's usually very much below the radar of most people. It's in chat rooms and meetings and like, you know, clubs and all that. Yeah. And it's kind of a closed group. Um, they use dog whistles. They used to use dog whistles instead right. of air horns. To <laughs> well, and they also just look the other way. Yeah. Um, right, yeah. Mika addresses, uh, addresses the question of where Trump supporters come from whether mm -hmm. Trumpism is cohesive with some kind of white working class or the poor or the poorly educated. Uh, and we we keep, you know, I keep seeing articles that try to unpack this because everyone wants to believe that Trump is, Trump and his supporters are some anomalous, anomalous group. Anomalous hick. Right? right. That they're poorly educated people, that they're rural people, that they're aggrieved people who have no. some some obvious and clear thing in common. Yeah. Um, people had the idea they're mostly poor, disenfranchised workers in Rust Belt or states or mm. coal mining states. But um, large cohorts of wealthy white men and women went for Trump, too, right? There's yeah. this statistic, which is a little shocking if you haven't heard it. 53% of all white women voted for Trump. Yep. Of all women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All, all women, period, or all white women? All women. women. Yeah, 50, so more than half of all women voted all for Trump. All women, period, voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. So um, the narcissistic, this is a quote, yeah, the narcissistic nature of elevated expectations, resentments, and desire for revenge mm -hmm. on specific targets and or society in general for not meeting those expectations is what sociologist Michael Kimmel called aggrieved entitlement. So this mm -hmm. is... I don't know that I got the word from this essay, but we started using this phrase, aggrieved entitlement. entitlement. I started hearing it recently. Uh, I think people have started bringing it up um, around these uh, issues mm -hmm. of mass shooters. 
Oh yeah, who yeah, yeah. Se- mm-hmm. seem to be like venting their sense of aggrieved entitlement. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it kind of fits the Trump supporter mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. they uh, basically are doing cultural stochastic terrorism. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I like this one when it was like just clocked with a glass at the Applebee's or whatever it was. Yeah, we're yeah. hearing. I don't know the. We're hearing more and more of these stories. I, I think we're which, hearing more. I don't probably, know. Probably having I, more. I don't more. know. In which um, people are basically swatting minorities. You know. Oh yeah. Like yeah. calling the police on minorities in oh, yeah. ordinary context. <laughs> ordinary settings. That's that's not happening more. You don't think it's happening more? That's not happening more. I think it's no. probably happening more. But not that it hasn't been happening. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think we're talking about it more. Do I don't you? think it's happening more. You think this is just that like the thing? Me Too movement? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think this is just okay. how it is, and we're talking about it more. Yeah. I was I was thinking more of the the sort of actual uh, like violent crimes, like this woman. Yeah, at the Applebee's. At the Applebee's. Wearing a... a um, Speaking Swahili. Speaking with his Swahili, wearing a hijab. Yeah, yeah. And this woman in the booth next to her stands up, starts shouting at her, and then and punches then her with cl- a glass. clocks her in the face with a glass and does right. a lot of damage. A lot of damage. Cosmetic, a, yeah, a lot of damage. Right? some real gashes. Right. I think she had to get nine stitches. It's going to be weeks, yeah, months of sure. recovery. Um, I suspect that may be happening more. Yeah. And I think that's in the stochastic terrorism space. Okay. Yeah. But I, I think that's happening more. I think that's in the stack. I don't think the, the swatting where you call the cops. Yeah. I, I, you don't think that's happening more? I, okay. I really don't. I, just don't. I was just listening to this, uh, reading this piece of, uh, about this uh, black family that was barbecuing at a at a park, yes. right? A, a, where people barbecue, right? Yes. <laughs> and a, a woman showed up and apparently spent like hours berating them and threatening them and demanding that the police come and remove them or something on right. the grounds that they were using charcoal in a space that was reserved for coal, you know, for like, um, for what's it called, you know, uh, briquettes, yeah. right? And that was her grounds, I guess. Oh, yeah. But it quickly devolved into the N-word and all these insults and Well, no, whatnot. remember our neighbor was all freaked out because we were burning wood instead of charcoal right. for our marshmallows in our backyard right yeah uh, you know just no like, it's and uh, th- there is th- that is this thing where like yeah. if you're a minority and you break the rule even though and, the, when the police showed up they said oh yeah that's on the sign but n- nobody enforces those rules, rules right it's just not like what's the point of the point? strictly enforcing the, these this rule. rules no and really we invited her to call the fire marshal because this right. is insane right right but go on right. yeah I don't know whether this is happening more, but at least, but okay, I'm at least hearing a lot more stories about yeah. this swatting, right. right? This woman in Harvard who, you know, Yale. was it Yale? Okay, Yale. I'm sorry. Don't confuse them. <laughs> there are some people for whom it matters. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere out there. Somewhere. Okay, but this kind of thing happens at, 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 yeah. all over. But um, yeah, this, the, the, the unreported bit I felt of that story, mm-hmm. where to, from of what I recall of it, this this woman, this black woman was uh, had fallen asleep studying in a student lounge. Yes, right. Which which is so weird. Which is so weird. Does anyone do that all the time? <laughs> I know. I know. At college. I used to. Day, I night, used afternoon. to wake up in the lounge. <laughs> right. Well, right. Whoa! Well, what right. happened, man? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it'd take me a moment to figure out even which room I was in, right? No, I frequently went to the the library yeah. and would like People have to fall go through sleep in the library. Well, no, the I'd go to like three rooms before I found one without someone sleeping in it. There's yeah. like study lounges, right. like the like right. semi private. It was ones. a routine routine part. Of the the job there is to mm-hmm. like rouse people when they close the building, right? To wake people up before they, yeah, right. But this this um, here, here's the unreported part of the story. Okay. I'm I have a s- strong suspicion that the the white woman who called the campus police mm-hmm. um, knew that this woman was a student and yes. had seen her around in the dorm many times. Had probably seen her studying many times in this lounge. Mm-hmm. But because now she was sleeping, there was probably a little placard somewhere with a rule that said no sleeping, you know, maybe. Mm -hmm. But because she had broken a law, whether a rule, not Mm -hmm. a law, a rule, Mm -hmm. whether it was even a real rule or one that existed only in her head. Her brain. It didn't matter. That suddenly is like, oh, now, you know, now I get to 
act out my petty revenge fantasy. Oh, did you see the the commentary that basically the cops are like Apple Care for black people? Yeah, <laughs> like you know, if you're being annoyed by your new product, you know, you can always call the cops to <laughs> don't swat away the annoyance. You know, I, I was at um, at Meyer and I was yeah. buying a few groceries and I was checking out like I had maybe six things in my sure. little basket mm-hmm. including a prescription and um I was checking out in the 12 items or less express lane yes and the woman in front of me is like unloaded all this crap on the belt and she's like oh smirk oh it looks like I have more than 12 items and I really was like I want to call the police. I think I should call the police. I think I should call the police. This woman's clearly breaking a rule. Yeah. Maybe they'll, it, maybe the, like five linebacker sized officers will leap on her, break her collarbone and drag her across the floor. Maybe they'll tase her. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. Cause that makes sense. Right. That's a rational <laughs> response. Apparently. <laughs> But apparently that that seems to be a rational response for people. I will say this. Everyone now, Mm -hmm. every place I go, is more worried about everything. Oh, yeah. The economic stress has gotten, uh, things have gotten harder and harder for most people. Yeah. And everyone's tolerance of each other is lower. Yes. I was at Discount Tire Waverson. on Friday morning, mm-hmm. and a guy who was in line before me had been waiting a little longer than me, mm-hmm. and he threw a tantrum. Right, yeah. there's really no other way to describe it. Yes, he started just berating the, the staff, and the yeah. the guy behind the counter is like, "Well, I can give you your keys back if you need to leave," you know. Right. And he just started ranting. He's like, "Oh, and for a penny, and for a pound, I've been here this long. I might as well stay hey, here." And he's like, and he's like done. looking around at all of us, like, "Am I right? Am, Am I, I right? right? Come on, yell at the yell at the poor discount Dude, tire employees sorry. with me, you know? Fuck those guys." And I'm like, "Dude, chill I out. I don't actually want to fuck those guys. Uh, they're right. just working here, right? <laughs> just trying to do it. Yeah, job. it's annoying that they took longer. Uh, they told me an hour and a half, and it's been three hours before they got a chance to look at my car. But you know what? I didn't take it out of them. Yeah. And I got my tire fixed for free because it took it's so dull. long. Oh, hey. So, <laughs> anyway. Tried to make it worth your while. But uh, no, this this sort of, um, <clears throat> this space where we're all primed to, to go like, off. To go off. Yeah, that's That's, that's planned real. and wanted. That's, that's real, real. And I'm pretty sure it's planned and wanted. Yeah. Because yeah. then you can just kind of poke the hornet's nest yeah. and something will happen. And when when you know, when we're all berating the poor schlubs behind the counters God, everywhere. Was, yeah. Um we're not punching up. We're mm-hmm. not dragging the billionaires out of their homes. And, or the Nazis. And, or the Nazis. or Nobody's yeah. building guillotines. You know? No. Sad. Anyway, so. Oh, that may be a criminal offense. <laughs> just building guillotines. Uh, just so you know. Uh, carry on. You, you were saying. Uh, so back to the, back back to the propaganda to the book. So um, the narcissistic wounds often date to the supporter's personal ancient past. Mm-hmm. And more often than not, are perceived rather than real. Mm-hmm. So the choice of the object of this vengeful punishment mm-hmm. is not based on reality. It's based on the displacement and projection characteristic of the scapegoating process mm-hmm. that becomes an inextricable, blah, 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 inextricable, inextricable, blah, 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 blah. Uh, part of the narcissistic collusion between the tyrant and his followers. The scapegoating designates the others as an object upon which the narcissistic revenge will be inflicted. Mm -hmm. So this isn't really about, it it isn't necessarily even really about the the fact that these, or anybody that these had people had a huge animus their whole lives against immigrants or against blacks or whatnot or whatever it's just like in the moment there's someone who's not one of us yeah not one of us get them the tyrant and his followers i'm, I'm quoting again typically choose as vessels for their negative projections and aggressions the members of society who are not just different but weaker mm-hmm. 
right? More vulnerable. Right. They, yeah. Uh, Mika writes at some length about the ways in which the followers' projections reveal their own pathologies. The tyrant actually doesn't have to work very hard to incite his followers. No. Because, quote, the tyrant's permission for such aggression appears to be a large part of his appeal to the blood and revenge thirsty followers. Mm -hmm. So I'm just remembering when Trump appeared at his rally and someone was protesting and he was telling his supporters, knock the crap out of him, will you? You know, he was saying that he would pay their legal fees and whatnot. And the crowd did not say, wait a minute, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa, whoa." whoa. That That didn't happen. No, no. Yeah. Um, The end game. She talks about the end game. The Mm -hmm. role of the tyrant supporters, quote, becomes more important with time as he psychologically decompensates. And Mm. we have to unpack that word. Um, When a person with a deep psychopathology, Mm -hmm. this malignant narcissism or whatnot, Mm -hmm. has to appear sane in -hmm. public, it's an effort. Yes. Right, to rein in all your random bullshit, your random behavior, your self-aggrandizing behavior. You know, I mean, it's an, it's called the mask of sanity. Is anyone claiming that Forty Five is doing that? I don't think you can claim that he's no, doing that. No, what they're claiming is that he was never very good at it. Okay. But now he's getting worse. Oh. oh okay. And so that's the decompensation. Mm-hmm. So it inevitably happens to narcissistic psychopaths in positions of ultimate powers. They decompensate because they don't need to keep the mask up anymore. Right. Because their supporters will shield them. From anything, really. For anything. So he doesn't need to gain any more power. Mm-mm. And when you're president, there's no one who can really question your orders or push back effectively, right? Not so really. you drop the mask. Mm-hmm. You're not so willing to sugarcoat anything or even attempt to be civil to anyone. Right. Your inner circle will go to great lengths to protect him, you, even as his craziness becomes more obvious. More right. Intense, right. Uh, and they, it, they actually tighten up. They actually, they, they, um, what do you call that? Like they form a, a oh, circle the wagon. They circle the wagons. Circle the wagons. Right. Yeah. I was thinking a rub, rugby <laughs> defensive oh. line or whatnot. <laughs> yeah. Um, none of us knows how this will end. In particular, a lot of people, especially a lot of liberals, self-proclaimed progressives and whatnot, uh, still um, are imagining this tidy end game. They're like, well, when they finally uncover the right fact, or when there's an indictment, the right <laughs> indictment comes down. <laughs> Mueller is going to ride in on a white horse <laughs> and save, and save us. us. There's going to be a twenty. There's going to be. Uh, he's going to be dragged out of the White House in irons, right? It'll be great. Or he'll be impeached, and then something, um, you know, something It'll will happen after that. Or there'll be some kind of Twenty Fifth Amendment remedy brought into being um Out of the but this is there's no evidence from american history that this is really going to happen it's not even clear to me that you yeah. can indict successfully a sitting president if they try it is a de facto constitutional crisis, crisis. Yeah. right that doesn't mean that he's out of office no it means actually that that's an excellent opportunity for him to change the rules of the game. To change the rules of the game. Altogether. For the court to rule in his favor to break the institutions sure. that exist to provide these checks and balances. No. To like to break smack them, them down, break their backs. Right. Yeah. So I'm not sure we want to push that button. But no, hey, I don't actually doing? want to see. And in Watergate, the, the smart people did not want to see what actually happened they actually if you indicted. indicted a sitting president, right. because it was really unknown territory, right? and it still is. So, yeah. yeah. So, but the, the, Actually, but the, the liberals right now sound yeah. like 
the fever dreams of all the Obama haters for yes. like eight years. It does. It really sounds like all their fever it dreams. It really does because you had all these accusations so, of yeah. of his horrifying abuse of power, right? Uh, you know, he's coming to take your guns. He's yeah. coming to do this. He's yeah. it's tyranny. This yeah. is the and people say we suffered for eight years under Obama. Really, yeah. tell us tell us where the black man yeah. hurt you. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. And so they they much, weren't but... talking about the actual dronings oh, and you no, know. they weren't talking about the actual tyrannical abuse. <laughs> right. Right. The, the, but his, whatever. His abuse of the immigration system and all that. Right. They we weren't, weren't discussing talking about that, that. Like at all. The, what they were talking about was imaginary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, and this sort of Russia Gate scandal is largely imaginary yes <laughs> and just this sort of like just these little wisps of truth to like yeah. spin it around yeah but it's just this ludicrous fever dream yeah and you know we should be clear i really do believe that trump was very much financially mobbed up with a bunch oh, of russian yeah. 45 people who is a scumbag debts. he's got all right. kinds of criminal connections all kinds of criminal collections uh, he's compromised respect. yeah but yeah that doesn't mean there's a lot of steps between that and oh he's actually being impeached and then after his impeachment there's a resolution to remove him from profit. office or something like that it's like and then we profit it's, there are a lot of steps. people who are still really relying on trump to further their own agendas yes and as long as that's true they're not eager to get rid of him at all I mean, it's the same thing with because if you look at, look back at Reagan, we had the same sort of trajectory. Well, th- was there more you want to say about the book? I, I'm just Let's about you, go ahead, winding okay, up. Go ahead, with say, the book. finish what you were saying about the book. Uh, okay, so it's all about anyway. So this this I think was one of the more interesting essays. I will not say that it made the book worth reading um, okay. or buying. I would not buy it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I finished the book. The conclusion is that it's not really a good book. One of the ways in which it's not really a good book is that there's actually a very short epilogue mm-hmm. that's um, attributed to Noam Chomsky, but he didn't even write an essay for it. He mm-hmm. offered, as they say in the introduction, which is almost longer than the epilogue itself, mm-hmm. he kindly offered to edit together some er, some existing remarks <laughs> <laughs> to uh, to add a, an epilogue to the book, right? And you know, he just—it's just some of his commonplace comments about the the doomsday clock and the white working class and all this. Mm-hmm. There's no new insight. It's not interesting. It's very yeah. brief, and so like he clearly didn't have all that much interest in this project when they approached him about right. it, right? And it shows. It shows. I and mean, I Chomsky think, was nervous enough about. Um, <laughs> 45's candidacy, they encouraged voting for uh, for Clinton for Secretary Clinton. Yeah, um, but I think that was the extent of what he had to say. He really as a strategy. He really didn't seem to have a lot of insight. I think he is finally slowing down. You know, yeah. like as far as his radical in his willingness to to yeah, espouse radicals. some radical insights on right. the situation. Yeah. But and wasn't very interested in this project, and I can see why. And I'm saying you should not be all that interested, interested in this project. Right. But there are a few moments that are in, of interest, and that essay I think is of interest. And so I'd actually like to see that essay somewhere Flashed on the web. Yeah. yeah, but I, I don't, I don't see it happening. Right. But I do feel disappointed that I. But you know what? I I borrowed the book. I didn't buy it. So, so there's that. There's no, what that. I was going to say is that we we. I think we saw a lot of this play out in the Reagan administration with like the um, uh the Iran Contra scandal. Yeah. Yeah. Where I mean, this was terrible. Right. It happened. And Ollie North took the fall. Yeah. And Reagan served eight years. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, we did that. And how many times could he not recall? Every time, basically. <laughs> Every time. 
Yeah. So, you know, so we can go there again. We can do that again. I mean, I guess it was fun the first time. There, I don't know. There were serious questions in his inner circle about mm-hmm. his competence, right? Legitimately so. Yeah, and legitimately so. Uh, so I don't but I don't it, mean to suggest they that... They didn't take him they didn't take him down. They didn't impeach. They didn't try a 25th Amendment had, remedy, you know. It had literally no effect on his presidency. Right. Right. So, I, I so we've actually we've run this gambit before. Yes. To no avail. Right. I mean, so none of this, this is not because I'm a secret Reagan supporter. Right. Or a secret 45 supporter. Well, actually. Actually. <laughs> mm. No, the, the deal is, I think we already know that this doesn't work. Yes. And if you're in this space where you've got to go on about how he's mentally unfit. Yeah. And make all these medical diagnoses of a public figure. Pseudo, yeah, pseudo diagnoses. Pseudo diagnoses and pseudo psychiatry um, in violation of, I don't know, every standard of ethics. (laughs) Um, I think we need to understand that this is a piece of propaganda. Yeah, yeah. um, And to what ends, I, I would only lightly speculate, but I think it's important to note that he's yet to cross Obama's lines of abuses. Yes. He's yet yes. to cross any of Obama's work. Right. I mean, he's on pace too, uh, right? To, but that that hasn't even happened yeah. yet. As far as I'm concerned, the worst and most most uh, nerve wracking thing that he's actually done in office so mm-hmm. far, as opposed to just speaking about, I'm right? just talking, yeah, just or just signing an executive order that isn't actually going to stand, or, yeah. right? Is uh, leaving the uh, the Iran, Iran nuclear thing. Yes, deal. that was actually bad news. That's actually a, a, a thing of actual worry. Yeah, and I, I'm not trying to defend his like ice, you know, no. or or say that that isn't really hard on a lot of families. It is. It's I'm indefensible. Talking, I'm talking about something that could seriously destabilize a whole region of the world, right? Even more you than know? it's already stabilized. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And. To, that's that I think this is finally he's done something that actually seems important mm-hmm. to me like important right yeah and, and again it's not so much that the immigration horrors aren't important right they're not new they're not this is new by this has been going on for more than 16 years yeah this has been a thing for more than 16 years and so w- if you're just now hearing about it right right the, the that's fact that this you. is a, that's on that's you. you this is yeah. a propaganda game and you know you've and, been on the losing end and trump's war on sanctuary cities is i don't think is actually likely to involve a nuclear exchange no right <laughs> so, no i don't see it so let's keep things in some perspective yeah. as to their importance i mean i think what <laughs> i mean we you talk about the followers and their response to their tyranny and i'm thinking about all the Obama bots and how literally blind they were to the drone attacks, how literally blind they were to his immigration abuses. Yeah. Well, basically and how after Obama was elected, the, the American peace movement just went up, away, just, went just away. like packed up their bags. Oh, it's all taken care of. Right? All done. And <sighs> had no criticism or response. And frankly had criticism for you. If right. you wanted to talk about his abuses. Right. Um, yeah. So, and then, and meanwhile, the, the same way that Hillary supporters weren't willing to talk about how now we have slave markets in Libya. Yeah, we can't talk about that. Right. Yeah. So, so it really, I'm not impressed with this analysis of Trump supporters. Yeah. If we're not applying the same analysis to Clinton supporters, right, and Obama supporters, I I do think the so narcissistic on. identification. Yeah. does apply to Clinton supporters. Oh, without uh, from question. From what, what I've seen. Without question. I didn't see it really this, really applying to Obama supporters it was in a such small, a big way. It was a small cadre. Of, Ob- of yeah. Yeah, these folks who, who like have him for their profile picture. Yeah, yeah. Or like on his That's, wife's birthday. That seems very telling to me. And yeah. I still see a lot of Clinton supporters now on Twitter with her picture with her as picture. their icon. No, it's always like they've got his wife's picture as their icon on her yeah. birthday. Yeah, yeah. That just seems. Uh, it's just a little too dear leader cult of personality yeah, yeah, for just, my I taste. I'm uncomfortable with that. Yeah, right. And the so, Trump supporters on my Twitter feed are the same way. They very often have his picture yeah, on their timeline. Like, yeah. So you yeah. know that's 
that's not a unique thing. Yeah. So they're describing a real thing. It's just not unique, and they're right. framing it as unique as is, is a propaganda tactic. I do think this this uh, essay on narcissism and all that does yeah. it is actually a useful tool to think about yeah. this thing. It's just that it doesn't suggest any real remedies in this case. No. It just it does suggest like what to watch for. What to watch for? I mean, you know, because you know, I think these are triggers that all of us are susceptible to. Absolutely. That okay. you know, there are people that I could be sucked into being a follower for. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, and you kind of have to watch yourself yeah well that's uh, yeah. so uh our next the the guy that wrote the next book i want to talk about actually talks about this oh yeah he talks about how dangerous it is to start to read your own press releases and how dangerous oh. it is to be concerned with your own fame mm-hmm. your own popularity it basically right. says once you start to do that once you start to read your own reviews no. you're th- you're finished he puts it's you're over. done for it's over, it's over. Yeah, and this this is Chris Hedges. So, oh, Chris. Yeah, he's all right. Chris is a, a writer, a speaker, uh, an activist that I've followed for a number of years now, yeah. and I really deeply appreciate his work. Yeah, and, and um, liberals like to dismiss him as like, oh, that guy needs a hug. <laughs> he's so depressed. No, he's just awake, motherfucker. Uh, so... <laughs> If you were awake, you'd be depressed too. Yeah. So you know. So I f- I finished a, a a book called Unspeakable by mm-hmm. Chris Hedges with David Talbot. So this is a short yeah. book. It's, it's an basically interview. an interview. It's yeah. a, it's an extended interview that took place like both in person and over email, and they mm-hmm. probably edited hashed out over email, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a series of short chapters. Um. And here's why I finished it so slowly. Like, it took me a year to finish this book. Oh, right? yeah. No, I, I ate it up. Um, yeah. That, I, I wanted yeah. to be able to give it my full attention and not read it while tired or distracted. Mm-hmm. And second, it is emotionally challenging. Yes. Uh, also morally challenging. Yes. So Hedges is not... I often read in the morning when I'm kind of in, like, taking a bath. Mm-hmm. I'm in the tub, literally reading a little bit before I head out. I'm trying to... Basically, yeah. settle myself down for the day and right. get focused. He's not exactly settling. Um, Chris Hedges, reading Hedges is not anything like a warm bath. No. He is an ice bucket challenge. Yes. Right? <laughs> straight up. Straight up ice bucket challenge. Uh, his writing is a serious challenge to this sort of liberal self congratulations. Yeah. Any level. Any level of comfort with fascism, poverty, militarism, racism, and all these sins, he sets the bar very high. Yeah. And his thinking always really challenges you to get to the root of it and yeah. get to the fundamentals of what's happening. Um, I have I one of the reasons I like to read him mm-hmm. is that I feel like we have some things in common. Mm -hmm. Um, He writes that starting at age 10 as a scholarship student at an elite New England boarding school, I was forced to make a study of the pathology of rich white families. It is Mm. not an experience I would recommend. Nope. Uh, He goes on to talk about his own uh, early history and some very uh, exclusive boarding schools as a Mm -hmm. scholarship student. Mm -hmm. Personally, I attended a private grade school for three years called the Erie Day School. Mm -hmm. Um, My brother and I were living in a trailer in Northeast, the city of Northeast, the town of Northeast, Pennsylvania. My mom was a single working mother supporting us. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the morning, we would get up super early. She'd take us to my grandmother's house and drop us off. And then we would walk down to the end of the road and wait for a van from the Erie Day School to pick us up to take us to the school. And so what, a combination, it was um, it was a two hour commute one way. Right. So I don't know, two not maybe not quite two hours, but, but it was still. well the the trip by van was well over an hour, and right. the trip by car was fifteen minutes. Mm-hmm. And then there was a waiting, <clears throat> and then there was a waiting. So we spent like well over three hours a day getting to and from school, mm-hmm. um, for the sake of a better educational opportunity, right? right? Uh, at the Erie Day School, the kids there were the children of the wealthier people in the Erie area, mm-hmm. such as they were. They were the children of 
bank presidents, like nursing homeowners and business owners and things like that. So compared, real sleaze in town. <laughs> compared to the people that Hedges was surrounded with, these were like nobodies, right? You know, yeah. that worth yeah. was tiny by comparison. But I recognize that sense of pathological entitlement and the bullying mindset yeah. that Hedges describes. So I'm going to quote him again here. Mm-hmm. I watched how the elites and the children of the elites treated those beneath them. Mm-hmm. I saw my classmates, boys of 11 or 12, order around adults who were their servants, cooks, and chauffeurs. It was appalling. The rich lack empathy for those who are not also rich. Their selfishness makes friendship, even among themselves, almost impossible. Friendship for them is defined as what's in it for me. They are conditioned from a young age to kneel before the cult of the self. I do not trust the rich. To them, everyone is part of their elite club or essentially the help. It does not matter how liberal or progressive they claim to be. I would go back to Maine and it would break my heart. I knew what my classmates thought of people like my relatives. I also knew where I came from. I knew whose side I was on and I have never forgotten. My family was a great gift. They kept me grounded. Amen. So, um, yeah, he was at Eagle Brook and then Loomis Chafee. Oh, right. I have several friends who went to Loomis Chafee. Uh, I'm sure you do. <laughs> so there's a lot more here that yeah. I quote in my yeah. blog, and I'm not going to, we're, we're starting to run long. But, oh, yeah, but, but still. It's... I'm not going to read it all, but I wound up also at a private college, mm-hmm. right? And I was a scholarship student. It, mm-hmm. To Just to be clear, it would never in a million years have been possible for me to attend Without scholarship. Worcester, mm-hmm. the College of Worcester, without mm-hmm. being a scholarship kid, almost fully supported by my mm-hmm. senior year, right? And I'm not going to claim again that everyone at Worcester was like this because Worcester was a bit more of an ecumenical school, you know, mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. that it did, a, no, especially it, yeah. it attracted a large number of international students who right. don't necessarily have the exact same pathologies as American rich kids, but they... Yeah, they had similarities. some. There's yeah. some strong similarities. Right. Yeah. And I ran into that attitude all the time. Mm-hmm. All the time. Yeah. And it was weird. Yeah. And I was an outsider. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, my education in some ways, because actually after three years, fourth through sixth grade, we were dumped back in the public school system. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't worth it, right? My education was stunted by being thrown back in the the really mediocre public school system, mm-hmm. but it just wasn't worth it to be, you know, among the to, among the to get the silly education, right? Because I, this is this is the dirty secret. Like, remember I was talking about. So, if you have to pay for graduate school, right? Um, it's kind of trash. Right. I mean, you shouldn't be paying for graduate school. But also, um, I, I just didn't have the stomach for more higher education. Not that I didn't want to learn more, but right. that I just literally, like I said, didn't have the stomach for, for it. It's too stressful, too competitive, right. too everything. To everything. Well, the other secret is uh, these elite schools, I mean, they are doing, the classes are better, right? Yes. And yeah. some of the pedago- pedagogy is better. Yeah. All that's true. And, and really, that's about wealthy people wanting their children treated with a modicum of dignity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's not about the education. The education is not no. what you're getting. That's it's the, other, that's the other big reveal right, right behind the curtain is, oh, a lot of these guys aren't actually smart. They're not smart. I mean, no, this they're not. They're both is, not smart and they're not interested in what they're learning. No. They're not interested in the thing, the terrible, classes they're in. Largely terrible students. And that was know? a, that was a revelation of like, oh, this class is so boring. Like, why, are, this was an elective. Why are you in this class? I'm excited about this class. About this opportunity. About medieval literature right right? i'm really excited i look forward to this class yeah right right? but you're like whining Mm -hmm. about it because you're (sighs) anyway no the other that wasn't true of every class what it's for it's it's not about education or being educated yeah it's networking camp 
that's some you know it's you were the networking camp you were the person when we were dating i think you actually explained to me what an elite education was for and no one right. else had ever explained that to me in a way I'm like oh, oh i get it you know every, suddenly everything suddenly all these makes sense all these events all these banquets it's all these awesome. special programs all these trips all this makes this sense. and that makes sense right and no one ever explained that to me because right. my mom didn't know. Didn't know. You know? Yeah, yeah. She came from a much more egalitarian world frame. Yeah. and frame mm -hmm. and, you know, was not cynical enough to unpack that. You know, she right. did not see the world in this us versus them right. no, mentality. It's, yeah. it's a networking camp yeah. and, um, and higher education is uh, about partnering yeah who you know well no uh, getting a spouse that too right yeah that, that's that i was aware of i was aware right. that there, there were some women there who were young women who were there for an mrs oh, degree and, <laughs> and men and men yeah i think it works that way too uh, absolutely huh. absolutely in other words where are you going to find your wife after college yeah that's true right, it no. was a thing actually that they um talked about sometimes that, people that they were about. kind of proud about like is saying some like two-thirds of our graduates actually met their eventual spouse at, at worcester yeah right yeah and you that's know that's code <laughs> if if um if, you know i wasn't mature enough to be choosing a spouse i was barely mature enough to be dating right. at all to be honest yeah, yeah. um so, you know but um you know if i'd met the right person it's possible that Probably mm -hmm. not, certainly not while I was a student, but right. Yeah. But some years later, maybe I would have married that person. Mm -hmm. But um, it didn't work out that way. Yeah, <laughs> so, largely because I just didn't feel deep down like I had enough in common with most of the people there. Right. Right. So there's two videos I'm going to link to. Um, there's the uh, college commencement that he ruined for everyone. <laughs> oh, gosh, the best college commencement This was ever. right in the run-up to the oh, Iraq War. It was beautiful. And he was invited because yes. this was a college uh, that was founded um, with the... Um, uh, one of their founders was like a radical anti-fascist. Right, right. Was, yeah, yeah. And the, or like a, wasn't he like an anti anti slavery advocate? I, I think so. An abolitionist. abolitionist. I think one of the founders was an abolitionist. Right. Yes, carry on. <laughs> and, um, that is anti fascist, but still. I'm, I don't have a note. Uh, you know, I don't have a, a note here to rem remind me what the school was. The school was, yeah. But it was liberal arts college, and that's pretty yeah. much what you need to know. And mm -hmm. uh, this was right. So he was invited by the administrators. Mm -hmm. who knew full well what he was what gonna, he was gonna say right and he warned them too he said this is look, gonna be i'm gonna you, say my thing you want me to say my thing because i'm and, gonna say my thing and don't like, give me yeah, the mic unless you yeah. want me to say my thing and so during right. this during his talk they keep interrupting to say this school was founded on the principles of of not stifling dissent of encouraging open and frank discussion, discussion of dissenting views Jeez. But the students are not having it. No, largely. The students are foaming for war. Uh, yeah, because yeah. this was right about the time when the liberals were signing on to the war in Iraq. Yeah, and it's really the sick. students were all. See, I would have, this would have been a great commencement. I would have been like, "This is the best day of my, my life." life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because yeah. they're usually just so vacuous, right? No, but you know, like, like how to succeed in life. Yeah. <laughs> But carry on. But no, they they were trying to boo him off the stage. They eventually no. succeeded in cutting his talk short, and he was like escorted Escort off campus stage. quickly. Right. You yeah, know. with a security detail. Yeah, yeah. Because no. um, so so that was a great moment. This was, uh, and then he was uh, invited by the New York Times to never do anything like that again. Yes. And so he, rather than. Agree to that. Agree to that. He decided he was on his way out and he looked for an exit from right. the New York Times. He was a reporter, a war correspondent. For the New York Times. Uh, for One years. of his great books that I think people don't talk about much anymore is uh, uh, War is a Force That Gives yes. Us Meaning. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great. Okay. Oh, okay, so it's a painful read, but it's a very yeah. insightful book. But yeah. be warned, all of Chris Hedges is, is, like is, that. is deeply challenging on yes. a visceral level. Yeah. I've. 
I've never not read him and not just had to put the book down. Yeah, I just got to gotta put it down it and just while. step away for a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mentioned in the the blog there's a um, he wrote an article in which he quotes some of the famous American anti-war activists from the um, free speech years, you mm-hmm. know, the Berkeley protests and all that. Right. Talking specifically about Antifa and yeah, yeah. and violent. Uh, using violence to protest or being willing to use engage in violence to protest fascists Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Hedges doesn't believe that's a valuable strategy right and I'm I'm struggling with that a little bit he and I are figure are a little bit odds at odds over tactics I understand well actually here's the thing yeah um and this is this is very important to understand this thing this part of it yeah um the only people who can use violence have a measure of privilege to yeah. engage violence. Yeah. It requires a measure of privilege to engage violence. It, when t- tactics become violent, it further marginalizes the marginalized. It because does. Because they're going to bear the brunt of the crackdown. He actually talks about that. He's like, when the when, crackdown comes, that's when, where it'll be hit. Hardest. When the Antifa put on their face masks or whatnot and mm-hmm. fight the Nazis, mm-hmm. um, they're the ones who are going to appear on the front page of the paper yes. and l- lose the cause, its support. They hurt the cause, mm-hmm. right? Because people th- just don't like that. They're, they have an, uh, an understandable revulsion against violence. Right. Even fighting people who showed up to bust heads. Right. Well, and here's, this is... And I won't exactly say that I part ways with Chris Hedges on this, yeah. Um, because I think it's more deeply nuanced than violence or no, yeah. Right? Because, uh, for example, I'm totally there for plowshares actions which destroy property. Sure. I, yeah. You know, I'm all about yeah. it. It's good. I'm not. I'm not. No criticism. He's he's talk in this piece. He talks specifically about about like fighting at protests right people who show up to physically defend, to physically fight, physically. fight and well, protest i think there are folks who are there for defense yeah and i don't mean like there's the non-violence no, training like we took. the church ladies that are, right. are you know putting their bodies on the line like in between the the groups of fighters right and groups of protesters which protests which is a, really a, that's an elite team to yeah. be, be perfectly honest yeah but then um, there are folks who are there armed and ready to fight in defense of people being attacked. Yeah. And like he says, those are the people that are going to be, that are going to be in the front page. Yeah. And here's the specific mechanism that uh, swings public opinion and creates sort of, and creates scandal, basically. Uh-huh. What if I'm the fascist tomorrow? Yeah. What if right. my political views are deemed fascism and then they're showing up to punch me? Right. That's likely not going to happen. I mean, are you at protest trying to punch old ladies? I don't know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so if you're not out trying to beat people up at protests, it's probably not going to be an issue. You know, yeah, yeah. no one thinks that far. Um, really, their their only frame is, "Hey, those people used violence. They might use violence against me." Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And now, mind you, this is what's very interesting about that frame: the folks who are white supremacists. Yeah. No one ever worries that the white supremacists will use violence against them. No, no. They plan it. They plan to induce a response. It's part of their strategy right. but from no, the beginning. And, it's, and that's it's a very... They talk it over in their chat rooms and right. all that. You know. and it's a, but here's this thing. This public response to white supremacy is carefully cultivated so the public is not afraid of white supremacists. Mm-hmm. They're never going to come hurt me. They know they're going to hurt people that don't look like me. Right. And they're okay with it. Right. So, uh, whereas uh, Antifa, yeah, hey, they're willing to stand up for people that don't look like me. That means they might hurt me. Yeah, and that's kind of weird. <laughs> it's kind of weird like that, right? So that's where it turns into this public opinion thing, right? When uh, Antifa supporters show up on the front page as the violent actors, yeah, right. That said, I think there's something. What, what did Cornell West say? Remember, he says, you know. We probably survived because of Antifa. Right. Those people were there right. attacking us, and they came they, ready to they throw down. They came ready to kill, and they did kill. Don't Let's not forget that they right. killed a protester. They killed a woman. 
Yeah, and injured many others. They injured very many. Yeah. So it's not a stretch to say that people survived those protests because Antifa was there right. to protect them. Right. Um, yeah, so, I mean, from what I hear, the people who are physically standing up, this is Charlottesville we're talking right, about. Right, right, specifically. There was a group specifically standing up to keep the the white supremacists from invading this um this housing public housing this public housing project right right because they were headed in there to just to start beating people up start beating people down yeah straight up beat create down. havoc and then you know the cops can show up afterwards afterwards yeah um so all that said i think there's some truth to all this public framing Mm -hmm. and there's a strategy question to be answered yeah and people need to be um have a certain amount of privilege to be in the position of engaging violence yeah but i don't want to dismiss the reality that when people still show up and start beating start the beat downs you're not a pacifist you know i'm not a pacifist no you got to defend yourself and your family right and again i understand that i'm saying that from a position of privilege right it's all, all I'm getting at really is to say that Hedges often challenges me to confront my biases and my oh, leanings yeah. Yeah. and say, no, you really need to step back and look at what works. What actually works. And he's talking about nonviolent protest and the historic role that nonviolent protests have played in ending um, numerous, unfair numerous situations right. around the world, even though the nonviolent protesters literally put their lives on the line many mm-hmm. times. Many times. Right. right. And, and this gets into deep questions about what actually works and what actually has long-term consequences and what's actually morally right. So this is, and this is part of all these conversations that we're, that we're touching on right now. Yes. Are really the font of why I kind of just don't do protests anymore. Yeah. And I feel like it needs to be... It's a very fraught thing right. as to what you're going to do if things go down. Right. You know? And that really where I need to put my energy is in my total praxis and how I live my life. Yeah. What yeah. I'm doing with each day. So... Chop wood, carry water. Can. Chop wood, carry water. Yeah. That's all you can do. So anyway, I'll, I'll link to a couple of videos. There's another one called the, the a talk he gives called The Myth of Human Progress and the Collapse of Complex Societies. Oh, that's it. It's yeah, a it's a, a bitch one. and talk, yeah. Yeah. To talk about an ice bucket challenge. Um, yeah. Anyway, we have been reading a book together, and we're yeah. almost done with it. We've yeah. been reading it to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a novel by Shirley Jackson called yeah. "We Have Always Lived in the Castle." Yeah. She's creepy as hell. <laughs> God damn. This is a great short novel. It really is. It, it really has. Is. Been, and, been reviewed over the years favorably by people like Stephen King and Neil Gaiman and all these modern it, horror writers as inspiration original. for them. Right. It and really I'm not, is. I'm not a fiction person. I've talked about yes. that before. Um, and it, it took me a while to, to warm up to, to her. warm up to her style. Yeah. But once I was in, I was in. Yeah. Yeah. Now the the way she builds up her characters is is really impressive, especially yeah, through dialogue. It's layer by layer, by it's really yeah. impressive. So the especially the dialogue between Constance and Mary Catherine. Mm-hmm. Mary Catherine gradually reveals herself to be kind of weirder and weirder, you know. To no, she gradually exposes herself as a complete psychopath, <laughs> just utter and total. In a, but in a sympathetic way. This bizarrely sympathetic. I, I I've never really been able to uh, feel a lot of sympathy for Mary Catherine. I'm just like I'm still like, the hell, you know, <laughs> like I'm just kind of like. Part of me is in this space of her cousin Charles, where I'm like, yeah, what the hell is happening? Seriously, right? right? right. Um, but actually, this is what I think is really happening for me as we go through the story. Yeah, Constance is slowly revealed. To be deeply crazy herself. Yes, right. Con- okay, so I'm like deeply, deeply ill. Yeah. Spoilers again. No, not, we're not gonna give it all away. But um, Constance is the older sister. She's 28, and Mary right. Catherine's 18. Correct. And um, they live together. Their parents died six years ago. They've lived together with an elderly uncle for six years, pretty right. much alone and isolated. Mm-hmm. Constance's 
a, a severe agoraphobic. Correct. She really likes and thrives in this very regimented, very passive environment where mm-hmm. she doesn't leave her front door. Doesn't leave her yard. She basically lives in her kitchen and her um, garden. garden. And That's seems it. to be perfectly content just serving other people, just doing... Making the, dinner, cleaning making up. Making food. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Mary Cat is the one that actually leaves the house to go get groceries. Yeah, gets groceries in town, picks library up library books. books. Right. Yeah, post office like that. Mary Cat is gradually revealed to be uh, a practitioner of sympathetic magic mm-hmm. and to have all these deeply schizophrenic ideas about how the world works, you know. Schizophrenic. Yeah. Well, she yeah. starts... Um, where she believes that she can control the actions of other people remotely by doing certain things like right. like she smashes a glass mm-hmm. and believes that now Charles will have to leave. Right. Cousin Charles. I'm just going to read, read a little passage. Sure. Okay. Yeah, do it. Do it. Um, Cousin Charles is still asleep, she said, and the day fell apart around me. I saw Jonas, that's her cat, in the doorway, and Constance by the stove, but they had no color. I could not breathe. I was tied around tight. Everything was cold. He was a ghost, I said. Constance laughed, and it was a sound very far away. Then a ghost is sleeping in Father's bed, she said, and ate a very hearty dinner last night while you were gone, she said. Um, Mary Catherine spent the night out in the yard under a tree. (laughs) Like she was so freaked out by his guy. She completely. slept outside she on a left. pile of leaves and a right. blanket under a under a tree. Under a tree. Right. Um, I dreamed that he came. I fell asleep on the ground and dreamed that he came. But then I dreamed him away. I was held tight. When Constance believed me, I could breathe again. We talked for a long time last night. Go and look, I said, not breathing. Go and look. He isn't there. Silly Mary Cat, she said. I could not run. I had to help Constance. I took my glass and smashed it on the floor. Now he'll go away, I said. Mm -hmm. So later in chapter five, uh, she recalls that uh, today was to be a day of sparkles and light. Mm. There were sparkles at the sink where a drop of water was swelling to fall. Perhaps if I held my breath until the drop fell, Charles would go away. But I knew that was not true. Holding my breath was too easy. Mm -hmm. And then later, there were sparkles in the mirrors and inside our mother's jewel box. The diamonds and the pearls were shining in the darkness. Constance made shadows up and down the hall when she went to the window to look down on Uncle Julian. And outside, the new leaves moved quickly in the sunlight. Charles had only gotten in because the magic was broken. If I could reseal the protection around Constance and shut Charles out, he would have to leave the house. Every touch he made on the house must be erased. Yeah. So, anyway, it's her character is fascinating. Yeah, really fascinating. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think what ends up shocking me is just how disturbed Constance is. Right. You and learn, I had been you gradually that, learn how to, that const that they're they're really codependent. Codependent. Very deeply codependent. Deep, and and. And I had I had been developing deep sympathy for Constance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, that's really unsettling for me. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. What? <laughs> what? It is. It is an unsettling, creepy book, but it's really wonderful. And yeah. part of the genius of the story is that, as um, this, if you, if I just tell you how it all comes out, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. It sounds fantastic. Like that's unbelievable. Please, right. But because because. Jackson builds it up mm-hmm. so gradually in the revelation of of these characters. Mm-hmm. By the time you get there, it seems inevitable. Right. What else would happen? Right. Right. And that is amazing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> all yeah, right. Yeah. No, she. It's good. Right. It's good. It's good. It's good. I want to. I want to read more of her. Most people, if they read any Shirley Jackson, they read The Lottery, a mm-hmm. famous short story. It's oh, often. Yeah. It's often uh, assigned in school. Assigned in school, uh, and I it's, didn't. I didn't have that in school. I was in yeah, school. Yeah, I did. But, but you know, it's a great story. But mm-hmm. she can do a lot more. <laughs> yeah, dang. So I want to read more Jackson. 
Uh, Ant Man. <laughs> now we get to oh, a, a sillier part, and I think we're going to wind it up after Ant Man. I have more notes, but I, if I spend, if I get into Tolkien, I'm going to spend like oh, forty we'll minutes talking night. about Tolkien. It'll be here all night. Come so on. I want to talk about Ant Man. Yeah. So this is one of the better reviewed of the recent Marvel movies. Mm-hmm. So. I recently was on the phone with you and said, how have the kids been? Do you think they deserve a movie? And you said, oh, actually, they were really Good. cooperative today. They got all their chores done yeah. and everything. I'm like, great, I'll bring home a movie. And then I went yeah. out, and because I hate to go to Best Buy, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to go back. And there were some DVDs on sale, so I bought four movies. <laughs> right on. And this was the first one we watched. I brought it yeah. home last Tuesday night, and we watched Ant-Man. I was surprised how much I enjoyed it. This was one of the better-reviewed yeah. of the recent Marvel movies. I, I, You know, I like superhero and action movies, yes. just like generally. But, yes. But sometimes but, they're... But a lot of these Marvel and DC movies, they're not that good. Not that good. Yeah. Uh, they're just like ticking boxes. It's like they're producing TV shows instead of right. movies. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're as and, and this disposable. had some of that. This had some of that. Yeah, but, but it, it, it. I think this it was one was it. better. It was better. So Michael Douglas plays Hank Pym. Mm-hmm. Um, he gives it a kind of like emotional weight because he has real screen presence. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he sort of keeps it from being too fluffy and frenetic. Mm-hmm. Um, I think without him, it might just easily feel like a romantic comedy yeah you know it does into that rom- rom-com <clears throat> yeah space. unfortunately uh evangeline lily she's pym's daughter oh is that who that is yeah i thought i recognized and her, but she I she her. was the female elf maiden in uh and love interest yes in the, in, hobbit. in the hobbit trilogy i can't even remember her character's name yeah no but it, um and just just for those of you playing along at home there is no female elf love interest no. in the Hobbit. <laughs> in the book, no. No, but in the movies, they and the the thing we drug this out for three. I've three discovered films. that originally, as they were shooting two movies, mm-hmm. she had this role, and it mm-hmm. was a cool role, but it was more like yeah. a warrior role, right? And then, the, as they were, as the studios were forcing them to turn it into a trilogy. They brought her back in, and she had said, I'll be in it on one condition, yeah. no love triangle. So what do they do? <laughs> and it's like, great. So she thought she was done shooting, right? and they called her back in and said, yeah, we need to do a few new scenes, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, the studio kind of wants a, a love, love triangle. Because that's like, awesome. Ah! <laughs> so she yeah. shot these scenes, to make a love triangle, and they're bad. They're bad. You can see it all over her face in the scenes. It's they're like, terrible scenes. You know, oh, the burning passion, right? It's like they're just not convincing. Right. But it's not her fault. It was stupid. No, it didn't it was really stupid. make any sense, and it was a I mean, last-minute addition there was to one the screenplay. Scene. There was one scene where she has this playful banter with Feely, or Kelly, yeah. whoever, right, yeah. in, where he's locked up. Yeah. That's the only scene that had any... Any spark, spark any convincing, energy. flirtatious right. energy to it right. at all. The rest of it was trash. It's just trash, and yeah. it's stupid. It, it really feels like it was retconned in, which yeah. in fact it in was. In fact it was. Yeah. So anyway, she's really good in this movie, though. She, yes, she's she good. Is. She's not a simpering, you know... Well, it's funny. She's... <laughs> She's, she's a tough believable. guy. No, she's a believable tough guy in this movie. She's a believable tough guy, right? right. But still, she has a little character development, too, mm-hmm. with her relationship with her father. It's it's pretty well done. Right. Right. So one thing that always confuses me, like, in in this movie, like, it's hooked into the Marvel Universe. Mm-hmm. So in this movie, the Avengers are real, right? Right. And they mention the Avengers, and they even meet one of the Avengers. Right. But then that just always confuses me because I'm like, okay, so... What movie am I in? In this movie, do these movies exist? <laughs> <laughs> are these other movies happening at the so same like, time in this movie? If this, if this movie is real, does the movie Ant-Man exist in this universe? How about the other... So is Doctor Strange <laughs> in New York while this is happening? Is Doctor in Strange in New York? So maybe the Avengers like movies exist, at least the ones prior to this point in time, right, right in this movie, 
but are they documentaries instead of fiction so, features? <laughs> Does Marvel Star Comics Star exist in this, in this universe? universe? And I get myself tied up in knots over what's happening. Over like, and I like, I just wish they would not even try and do these interfilm because they're commercials, right? It's exactly. a commercial inside the film. right. When when you try to make sense of the connections between this film and the other the films, film. and they're not like direct sequels or whatnot. No, no, they're it just, just appearances. Right? It's it's. Just nonsense. Right. Well, it's, it's product placement, and now yeah. it's nonsense, right? Yeah. So it's that's why it's jarring. <clears throat> right. So these characters work together well. Um, that it's a good script, right? It, it's a it's oh, a yeah. it's a tight it's script. Tight. It it's well edited. Well. Yeah. They keep uh, introducing scenes, and you're watching the beginning of the scene. And you're like, oh, I know where this is going. This is a scene I've seen a million times in movies. But then it turns. It turns, and right? that's not what happens. No, it's, right, so it's very satisfying in that way. Yeah, right. there, here's a non-spoiler one. So in the opening, Paul Rudd's character who becomes Ant Man is is in prison, and he's in a fist fight in prison where everyone's standing around cheering, and it's it's like a fight scene you really would see in Cool Hand Luke or Shawshank Redemption or Shawshank Redemption, Redemption or something right. like that, except that suddenly after they've beat each other up a little bit, they stop and hug and start laughing. And say goodbye. It was and good say goodbye. You. It's actually it's a touching time. goodbye scene. They were just like slugging it out. For old time's sake. For old time's sake. It's really funny. You yes, know? yes. This is actually my, I think my only genuine complaint about the film. Yeah. Is, you know, Paul Rudd, I'm sure, is a nice man. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure about that, but uh, you know, I have nothing bad to say about him personally. He hasn't been implicated in the Me Too movement yet, <laughs> or, any, or any other crimes. Yes, um, but they they really should have cast a black man in this role, and I don't know why. He's, it, I'll tell you. Yeah. Well, one thing is, all his friends are black and Hispanic. Yeah, and they introduce the movie when the music kicks in. It's like a not like a, a mariachi a song. It like seems it's, like yeah, it's clearly it's you know, it's very like set in a hispanic neighborhood right and the characters are hispanic right and it does feel like he should that like ant-man should be black or hispanic right so it's it's yeah it's actually strange to me and you you know there's the sort of well like you don't understand like race and politics and hollywood <laughs> grace no i mean seriously it's yeah. a strange casting choice he's not such i mean paul rudd he's a fine actor but he, i don't think he's such a big actor that he was going like, to be a huge draw uh, right but they just needed this on the guy strength to draw of his him. name i mean if, if that guy's in the movie that's michael douglas yeah right, yeah, right. but um there are other black avengers and sure, marvel characters sure. and ant-man there's no logical reason he would be a white guy. Not really. And there's his story. It's kind of like how how you know Lin Manuel Miranda thought when he read Hamilton's the biography of Hamilton thought of his experience as like a hip hop story. Right. Right. Ant Man kind of has a hip hop story, a criminal past, it's, and he's in prison in, and all this. It does right. sort of feel like he, he didn't separate it from his child. Right. It does and sort that, of feel. Right. Yeah. It's like Bill Clinton being the first black president. Like what? his story is a black person's story. story. So it's strange. He's just sort of a white man inhabiting it. Inhabiting the story, yeah. which didn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Like, huh. That's weird. So that's actually my only real yeah, criticism of the yeah. film. It's a, it's a pretty good movie. There, are, it is. there are, there's a supporting character I want to call out. Um, Michael Pena plays oh. this guy, and he is hilarious in really every is. scene that he's in. He's just really funny, deadpan humor, you know. Yes. Um, the movie has a whole lot of sight gags in it. Uh, I'm yeah. not going to give them away, but no. um, they are some of the finest sight gags i've ever seen in a movie yes some of the scenes are just edited the fight scenes oh, the even the, cli scene, the climactic, climactic fight, fight scene, scene is edited so well just perfect into oh. a series of sight gags just when the action should really be pulse pounding they like pop it with pop a it. pin yeah boom and the balloon explodes That's and you're laughing thing. your ass off <laughs> it's great it's really it, it's delightful to watch right with some young some children not really young kids but yeah so because it's all about size like ant-man is constantly shrinking and growing mm -hmm. right 
what's funny in these sight gags is when your perspective on this dizzying like whirlwind fight scene suddenly changes right and you realize the whole thing is this tempest in a teapot you right. know that it's it and it's it's really hilarious so um i noticed that this movie made particular reference to um richard matheson's book the the shrinking man Oh, uh huh. Published in 1956, a famous old science fiction novel mm -hmm. about, you know, that was like the ur text of shrinking stories. Shrinking right? stories, right. Humans shrinking down. Um, in that book, at the end, the main character keeps shrinking, right? He's shrunk yeah. down to the size of an ant and all that. And he keeps shrinking. At the, at the, as the book ends, he's still shrinking. Right. And you're like left with the uncanny sense that he's going into a an alternate world that we know reality. nothing about. Right. And you just sort of hope, well, hope it works out hope for, for you best. there. <laughs> See what happens, bud. Maybe he'll meet a, a tiny little wife and a tiny <laughs> little, you know. A tiny little village. But that's hinted at in the way that if your technology doesn't work right in this uh, movie, you'll keep shrinking. You'll just keep shrinking. And enter the quantum realm. Where nothing makes sense. <laughs> and the quantum realm, honestly, is a little silly. Yeah. Because what quantum mechanics actually teaches us is that there is such a thing as kind of a minimum size. Right. And if you do go smaller than a certain threshold, that that um, distance doesn't make any sense anymore. Right. And so you're you can no longer distinguish your velocity and your position. Mm -hmm. Any information you're carrying kind of is lost in the background noise. Right. And so... Well, I mean, think about it. If you're, the uh, atoms that make up you are smaller than the distance between atoms. <laughs> I'm, just, right. I'm just saying. So, you know? I mean, the minimal distance that, that at, at which we believe is sensible in our mm -hmm. reality is the Planck length. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, It's and, pretty long. And you go below that, and there's no way to distinguish. There's literally no way to distinguish your position anymore. Right. You know, for, you can't distinguish between here two points in space, between right. here and there. So there is a kind of minimal size. It's very small. I mean, it's ridiculously small. But, yeah. but you know. And so much of the physics in this movie, like if you start paying attention to the physics, the point. and you're like, well, how come he had enough mass in this scene, to punch the guy in the face, yeah. but then he landed on the record, and, and the record didn't even skip. Yeah. Well, it's, it doesn't make any sense, okay? So yeah. his mass changes from scene to, to scene, scene, depending on what the scene needs to be funny, and that's right. literally all that's it literally is. That's literally the rule, right? Yeah. And I think, for, I, I don't think, um, I think that's possible because the storytelling is good enough that you're not stopping to think about the yeah. physics. It moves fast enough that you really aren't like, well, you know, if Ant-Man was really that small and he was he was Actually moving yelling, at yeah. he was yelling to the people who are much bigger than him, There's no way his they could voice would be so high that it would be ultrasonic and they couldn't they even hear him. him. Or you can even like, even he wouldn't even be able to see light the same way that right. we do with these tiny, tiny irises in his eyes. He could right. only see very, very high, you know, very wavelengths, wavelengths of, light, of light, right? You know, it, it, a lot of a lot of that. A lot of it doesn't make any is, damn sense, right? which is fine. It doesn't need to. It's fine, but it, but here's where that I, I think that's going to come into play. So it sets up a sequel, and mm -hmm. even. Reveal the trailers for the sequel are out now. Um, mm -hmm. Ant Man and the Wasp, I think it's called. Yeah, and his uh, Evangeline Lilly is going to be the Wasp. Yeah, right, another shrinking character. Mm -hmm. But in the new movie, in the trailers, they reveal that they also, besides just shrinking from human to to tiny and back again, mm -hmm. they're going to be able to blow themselves up much bigger than human. Oh, yeah. And this is mm -hmm. going to take all of these physics questions. And just like double them, <laughs> so or exponential, or yeah. exponential. Like I, I'm because we're talking mass. I'm imagining yeah. that when we're watching these, the new one, it may seem more ludicrous. That it will be harder and harder to well, I'll tell suspend you what the disbelief. Problem, what the problem is is why the, what makes them ant man? What wasp and ants don't get big? Like why they don't? Why we don't have? 
enormous wasps, wasps and ants. the size of people flying around. And there so are on. there are reasons that have to do right. with the physics, right? The, so the I think square that's, cube rule and all these things. All these things. Yeah. So that's why it would be harder because it it doesn't even make sense in, just in terms of the nomenclature. Yeah. That he's the ant man. He's small. Right. He's not big. He's the Ant Man. <laughs> right now, he's going to be the 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 Mac the truck story? man, yeah, the, the two story man, or what? No, or what? Who knows. Yeah. But yeah, like there there are scenes where he's uh, has is involved with water, where he's like in a bathtub, someone's filling with water and right. all that, and like, have you heard of surface tension? tension. <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> it's no, a cool it's cool new a, trick. Yeah, the physics are ridiculous. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk briefly about this uh, this article? Oh, our main topic? Yeah. Let's have our main topic for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. And I, and I have to say, I'm throwing out four pages of notes on Tolkien and Tom Bombadil. <laughs> you can thank us later. <laughs> yeah. You know what? If you really want to hear me talk about Tolkien and the Fellowship of the Ring, leave a comment leave and a maybe comment. we'll do a show we'll just do a about and, we'll Tolkien because uh, yeah. cuz you can cuz this is basically when i'm reading the kids Tolkien i wind it there's each, so much there's so much and each chapter basically becomes a lecture by right. me on on Tolkien right. so. is that why Veronica's boycotting Lord of the Rings maybe the she's just sick of my lectures yeah I always loved my dad's lectures yeah I don't know I, you know I was a weirdo and a freak at <laughs> the beginning you know I just gotta say I feel like I have things to teach them but I will agree that the things that I have to teach them are obscure are obscure and they're not necessarily of interest to every <laughs> everyone. everyone especially every kid yeah yeah right so there's that so yeah if you want to hear the Tolkien talk you know let us know Escaping poverty requires almost 20 years with nearly nothing going wrong. Facts. Okay, just facts. This is a, an article from The Atlantic right? that uh, refers to another book. It's a book review. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a book review. MIT economist Peter Temin, T-E-M-I-N. And the book is The Vanishing Middle Class, Prejudice and Power in a Dual Economy. Mm-hmm. So I'm introducing it. I've been talking a lot. Go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I I may have a take that you hadn't anticipated. Have a take. And um, So I agree that escaping poverty requires almost 20 years of nothing, nearly nothing going wrong, and possibly then some. Yeah. And then an additional 20 years with nothing going wrong for you to stay. And actually build up true economic security. Security. Yeah. And then another 20 years for you to pass that to pass it on. wealth on. Yeah. So we're talking about a lifetime, 60 years. A successful lifetime. A successful lifetime of almost nothing going wrong. Yeah. Wow. For 60 years. So I would actually, so I would say it's much longer than 20 years, personally. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. Um, I have a lot of problems with the frame yeah. that, this, that this economist comes to us with. Right? The 20 years is basically a rounding up of what he says is uh, the process of getting enough of an education to break out of like the bottom 80% of the economic system. And and I just, that's a lie. Okay. Yeah. The idea that if you, if you play the card, your cards right for 16 years, you can break out of poverty. That's just a lie. Okay. Yeah. And I'd like us to stop telling that lie. Right. It's kind of making me sick at this point. I mean, there, what is this 16 years? He says, okay, so you spend 16, that's the nearly 20 years, um, from kindergarten through, through college. college. And if you. Undergraduate degree. The undergraduate or degree. Longer. Now you can leave and, and you can <clears throat> leave poverty. Um, yeah, that's a pretty heavy duty simplification. Th- yeah, that's, that's just that, not true. It doesn't actually grant you class privilege. No. Yeah. I mean, you can't, in, in class privilege, the way we've structured it in the United States, it's really hard to give it away. It is. Um, and there's almost no way to get it. Yeah. I mean, you have to learn all the codes, tells, all the codes all the and all tells, the tells. All the codes. That are, and, that come naturally to you by adulthood. And this is gets back to what you were talking about as like what college is for. What it's for. What an, what an elite, elite college is for. What an elite for. college, what, a, what an elite <sighs> education is for. Yeah. Because let's be, let's be honest, it starts in preschool. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, that's why there's this sort of fevered jockeying for position in these Manhattan preschools, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, so right off the bat, and you start, you know, a lot of factors have contributed to American inequality. Slavery, economic policy, technological change, the power of lobbying and globalization and so on. They've actually only said two things. Mm-hmm. They mentioned economic policy yep. and technological change. Yep. Slavery, lobbying, and globalization are all parts of economic policy. Mm-hmm. So immediately I'm suspicious if someone's trying to claim <clears throat> this sort of dissembling, well, there's a lot of reasons that inequality. A lot of factors. There's a lot of factors to inequality. Yeah. As if it's not some... As if it's not the system design. Right. right. As if these were just structural things that had happened over time. It just have happened over time. It just kind of, it's a little bit random. There's lots of things. Might have gone a different way. Yeah. This is how it went. This is how it went. And that, there's something fundamentally dishonest about that. That sort of raises my antenna. Raises my hackles. Um, Again, again, I'm not actually discounting this claim that it takes so long to get out of poverty. I'm saying it actually takes longer than this sort of, sort of shocking yeah. statistic. I did I did think that it, w- it was interesting because his analysis, he calls it the FTE sector. Yeah. Right? Uh, what, is, what are the FTE? Uh, uh, finance, finance, technology, tech- and electronics. Yeah. And he says it's, you know, one right. out of five, 20% right. of working people. This is a pretty similar analysis. To white working class. To white working class, where she talks about the P&E, professional uh, elite. At, uh, and a, Professional administrative elite. They're using, um, why when you have words that are similar? Um, synonym. Right, yeah, they're using synonyms and alternate terms yeah. to describe the same thing. Right. Right. Uh, and again, I I think I had some qualms with her that, okay, this is, they're it's so- they're, useful shorthand, but maybe not the full truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is useful shorthand. Yeah. There are pieces of truth here. Yeah. I don't think it's the whole truth. Um, and here's the thing. There are no working people that make policy. Yes. People yeah. who work don't make policy. The bottom 80% don't make policy. Right. Well, the bottom 98% yes. don't make policy. So even, even most of that upper, even most of that group, administrative and they're managerial not making policy. 20% or whatnot, they're not really making they're policy. They're not making policy. No. They're making a public endorsement of policy. Of policy. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's just be very clear. There's like this two percent that are making the policy and driving it through as legislation, mm-hmm. right? But then there's this other group, the remainder of that uh, uh, percentile, the t- top twenty percent, yeah, um, who give it a public veneer of acceptability. They're the Paul. Right, they're the poll. And if you think about it, the P- that's... The P-A-W-L and the ratchet effect, right? right? They're the, the poll and the ratchet they effect. They act as the, bat, the backstop. They're the David Brooks readers. You right. Know? Well, and yeah, the David Brooks readers, the Rachel Maddow watchers. New York Times readers. Et cetera, right? The folks who make the recipes in the New York Times. Yeah. Okay? Because there are very specific people who make the recipes in the New York Times. Right. Okay? And they're not... Um, they're not looking for a place to stay tonight. Yes. Okay. So, um, and that group, and if you think further about it, it's about, it's roughly the number of people who vote. Mm, interesting. Right? Because, you know, it's yeah. not all registered voters vote. Like this very right. small sliver of the right. population is actually voting. And to turn policy right. and give it a public face, give a public veneer of support, you need half, slightly over half of the small sliver of the population that votes. Mm-hmm. So, that's, so that's what he's talking about here. He's not being explicit about that. Okay. Um, he's claiming that the top 20% of working people make policy, and that's a lie. That's a that's just yeah. not true. Yeah, yeah, I so, can and, see that. So um, that's, no, no. And... Yeah, can I quote? Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. He writes that the upper class of FTE workers who make up just one-fifth of the population has strategically pushed for policies such as relatively low minimum wages and business-friendly deregulation to bolster the economic success of some groups and not others largely along racial lines. The choices made in the United States include keeping the low-wage sector quiet by mass incarceration, housing segregation, and disenfranchisement, Terman writes. But yeah, you're right. I mean, 
a lot of that 20% just goes along. Right. They're not That's writing all they this. have to do. That's all they have to do. They they're just not have to endorse. They just have to be willing to tolerate. Right. They're just signing know. on with it. Right. Yes. And, and, you know, if you ask them, they're like people I know that worked at Dow that say, yeah, I'll probably work for Dow forever. No, I don't. I don't have any objections to morally what they do in what the they world. Do, right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. All you have to do is be complicit. Right. Right. And I think the very important thing that he's leaving out in that analysis that it's there, the low wage sector is being kept quiet by mass incarceration, and housing segregation and disenfranchisement. He's leaving out the bread and circuses. Mm-hmm. The consumerism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that's, the, the, and the, the culture. The culture. The whole role of the culture. That that's really, none of this could work without that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it really could not function without that lubrication of the culture. Yeah. You, um, used, you used to talk about how Fox News is basically patting white working people on the shoulder and saying, you go, buddy. You're, you go. you're a good person. You're a good person. <laughs> yeah, right on. Right on. As you were. Yeah. Which... Frankly, MSNBC yeah. is doing the same thing for liberals for the other slice of the electorate, right. for the other narrow slice of the electorate that shows up at the polls. Right. And let's be clear, they show up because they're able to. Yeah. And they're voting to reinforce their their place in society. Their place. Um, the one thing that Temin argues that I'm going to endorse mm-hmm. without qualification mm-hmm. or reservation is that these this system exists by design. Yeah, these absolutely. barriers and the system as it is it's not flawed right it's working as intended. it's working as intended yep and i think as long as we don't understand that this is how it's supposed to work this is what is meant to happen mm-hmm. we're fundamentally uh, we're not even in the game right you're not even in the game if you don't understand that this is how it's supposed to work yep um so that I'm going to go all the way. Yes, that there I'm on his, I'm on the same team with him right there. Right. Um, and then he's got some suggestions, and these five proposals. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't thrilled by the five yeah, proposals. No, no and the thing that really really bothers the hell out of me is like everywhere I look now, they're talking about universal preschool. Fucking hell! You're gonna have children in school all day from the third birthday on. Yep. God damn. Seriously? At what point do they get to be kids? Well, when they're senile. When they're senile. (laughs) Jesus. No, it's just absolutely frightening to think about um, that it will be some kind of norm. And people will be explaining to me that, well, it's actually healthier for children to go to daycare than it is to be the care of their parents. Because, you know, they they learn skills and they meet other children and, you know, they learn how to socialize. And I'm like, what planet are you from? It's like the charter schools where kids learn how to be obedient. That's it. And that's the whole thing. That's yeah. the point. You have to toe the line when they when they oh. click the thing, or they spray you in the face with a water bottle like water a cat. Bottle. Meow. Um, there you are, poor kitty. He mentions repairing infrastructure. Yeah. Um, changing priorities to invest less in prisons. Yeah. Increase. And he's, there's this vague phrase. So we should say this is the reviewer. This isn't. The, the book. It's the, not a the, quote. It's not a quote from the book. The right. reviewer is talking about what he yeah. says. Including funding for those that can help build social capital and increase economic mobility. I, like, well, what that usually is... turns out to be some bullshit jobs program. I mean, yeah. McDonald's was getting Gets subsidies for, for to hire uh, workers. Mm-hmm. They were subsidized mm-hmm. to pay workers minimum wage mm-hmm. for their first six months of employment as a training wage. Yeah. And those workers, they could then turn around and dispose of and hire a new crop of subsidized workers, right? And never is pay that, a full minimum wage. Is but, that increasing opportunity? Is that but that's the uh, help, talking help about. helping to build social capital? Is that increasing economic mobility? No, but the, usually when people use weasel words like that, they're like, no, this is not universal basic income. No, no, no. The, it's like the Gates Foundation pushing to fund companies yeah. to develop solutions <laughs> to malaria <laughs> in the third world, right? You know, maybe they do some good, but mostly they make do well. They do well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. So it's, it's I'm 
we're not. This isn't a direct criticism of Peter Temin's book because we haven't read Peter Temin's book. But we just. But if this is representative, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not not impressed. So. I mean, these larger ideas that poverty is virtually inescapable, yes. and mobility in American society is like unheard of. Endorse. <laughs> yeah, endorse. Okay. Yeah, right. That this and this this system is like this by design. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the rest of it, though, it just sounds like a retread. I'm not. You know. It sounds like a retread, and it sounds like something you'd write to get tenure. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. That's cool. Yeah. So that I think that's the show. I think that's the show. How long have we been talking? A while. A while. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Hey, it's Mother's Day. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day. All your mamas watching. Yes. Listening. Well, you know, if they're on YouTube. You could watch. You could watch the baby. You could watch the baby for two hours. <laughs> See if she's going to move, crawl off move. the screen. <gasps> she moved. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Yeah. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. See you next week. Bye-bye.